You're listening to the LaunchCast, your favorite podcast on the planet, brought to you by Launchpad 516 Studios with me, your host, George Andriopoulos. We're talking leadership, business, life, and growth right now as the countdown starts. It's like food for your ears. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Joel Cassio, influencer, motivator, personal trainer, but most importantly, professional wrestler. And in the professional wrestling world, I'm referred to by the moniker of the life-changing Joe Ocasio. So it was only befitting that I was invited onto a podcast that is so grand, that is so extraordinary, that for all of those who appear on it, it is also in turn life-changing. Yes, I am honored to have been invited onto the launch cast by George um, I really cannot wait to share my story with everybody listening, um, but there is a second reason I'm going to be there. For those of you who don't know, George has a desire to be involved in the professional wrestling world. That desire is so strong, he actually has an alter ego by the name of Muscles Marinara. Well, I'm just here to let you know, Muscles Marinara, if you show up to the launch cast while I'm there, you're going to find out firsthand why I'm referred to as life changing. At this time, I'm going to ask that you fasten your seatbelts. Launch sequence. Launch sequence activated. Launch sequence activated. Five, four, three, two, one. Woo! There we go. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to the LaunchCast. Episode 321. I finally got it right after five takes. This one's called Wrestling with Leadership. This is one I am excited about today. In fact, I'm not even going to do the usual intro, guys. I'm going to cut this off. Episode 321 is coming at you today. But this ain't just any episode. No, 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 no. We have gold on our show today. Gold in the form of a wrestling champion, the life changer, Joe Acasio. And that's, that's normally the moment where I drop the beat and do my usual intro, but I'm going to keep going here. Since we have a wrestling champion on here today, it is only right that I activate heel mode right now and tell everyone that the real champ is here and give the people what they want the greatest promo intro that the launch cast has ever seen. That being said, I have yet to introduce myself. So Fabrizio, cut the music. It's me. It's me, the launch D-A-double-D coming at you from the studios at the LP smack dab in the middle of the D-A-L-E right here in Farmingdale, New York. Oh, it's true. It's damn true. Now, if you don't know me, let the champ tell you about himself. I am the three-time, three-time, three-time TEDx speaker, the Farmingdale High School Hall of Famer, the former heartbreak kid, but I'm not your sexy boy. The thought leading, TEDx speaking, truck riding, business class, flying, wheeling, dealing, business healing, son of a gun, woo, the most electrifying podcast host in thought leadership and entertainment, George Andriopoulos. And if you're not down with that, we got two words for you. Subscribe and share. Now I am here today with the man that they call the life changer, but it seems like I'm changing your life, Joe Ocasio, because I decided to book your 25 cent ass on my million dollar show. Now, you said in your promo, which I'm going to share here on the LaunchCast, when you guys listen to this episode, you will hear this promo. You said in your promo that you were hoping to see my alter ego, Muscles Marinara, come out. Well, brother, whether it's George, Muscles Marinara, the launch dad, I have had every name in the book, but the only book that matters right now, if you're watching this video, is the book of Launchpad 516, which says I'm about to school your ass talking about leadership, business, life, and growth. And do you know why? 
It doesn't matter if you know why, Joe. No, 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 no. There's only one reason why we're talking about all my favorite things today. We are talking about leadership because the launch dad says so, and that's the bottom line. Let's get to the show, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to bring him on screen right now. My guest today, and before I do the real bio, let this man respond to you. My guest today, Joe Ocasio. You're right. My name is Joe Ocasio, and I am an influencer, motivator, personal trainer, business owner, but most importantly, professional wrestler. Now, before we go forward, let me just talk to you, George Muscles Marinara, identity crisis. You sit here and you say, I'm worth 25 cents. Well, let me ask you something, George, with your million dollar presentation. You sit there and you talk all this smack, and you have to rip off all the people that you've seen when I'm just me and I'm real. I've wrestled Vader. I've wrestled and defeated Abyss. I've wrestled and defeated Jay Lethal. I mean, I could just go on and on to the legends and the current stars of today that I have defeated. I wear championship gold. And I know this, Muscles Marinara, you were in the ring in what, 2005 for a cup of coffee? How many championships have you won? You fight for people, and I appreciate and respect what you do, consulting, marketing, TED Talks. I mean, you are a leader. You are a thoroughbred. But you do that all with your words, Mr. Muscles Marinara. I change lives with my fists. So if you want this to break down into what I do best, beating people, I'll show you why I'm worth a million dollars and more, and I'll change your life. My man, that's how you do it. (laughs) That was good. I think we can actually have a pretty good program, my friend. <laughs> That's how you do it. I had another one where I get real, but I'm going to jump right into this. because uh, <laughs> Maybe I'll give it to you later. So, so first of all, this is like such a blast for me. Uh, for, for those that know me, I don't know if I've ever talked about wrestling on this show before. I am a total wrestling nerd since day one in my Hulk Hogan jammies, jumping up and down, eating the vitamins, saying my prayers, the whole thing since since early 80s, probably 84, 83, 84 is when I started watching uh, wrestling. So um, we'll, we'll get into this whole thing uh, today, but let me, let me just do the bio here because this man deserves it. So my guest today, Joe Ocasio. Joe Ocasio is a professional wrestler and the champ who currently holds the FFW Heavyweight Championship and also holds the FFW Tag Team Championship. He is a fitness expert and a dedicated personal trainer when he's not battling in the squared circle. Joe started his journey battling obesity through his childhood. He began amateur wrestling in middle school, but after sustaining an injury in his junior year of high school, He was exposed to professional wrestling for the first time and discovered his dream. He started officially training in 2010, was the head trainer of a wrestling school by 2014, and had wrestled for Evolve by early 2016. After a promising launch to his wrestling career, Joe battled various injuries and eventually faded out of the wrestling world. In 2019, though, he got a call from his old tag team partner to start up again, and eventually the comeback happened, but it was derailed by the pandemic. Joe has founded Joe's Result Zone, his personal training business, after spending nearly a decade in the fitness industry and works with clients of all ages, providing safe and challenging programs based on the client's specific needs. But that aside, now that the world is starting to get back to normal, Joe is back as a singles wrestler going by life-changing Joe Acasio. Man, it is a pleasure to have you here today. Some entrance, man. Thank you. I can't even be mad about the promo before. <laughs> uh, thanks so much. No, uh, it's it really, I, I mean, uh, we've spoken in the past before. We have that mutual friend, Steve. Yeah, man. Um, and I, I'm really honored to be here. It means the world to me to to be invited here onto your podcast and get to share my story. And uh, it's going to be really cool. It's been no, fun so far. I'm happy to have you, man. It's 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 always interesting uh, when, I, when I speak to a, a potential guest. And, you know, some people are on the circuit, um, they do these interviews, they do these podcasts, whatever, and, and they feel like they're pros or veterans and and uh, deserve to be here. And then you have a guy like you who's accomplished so much in different ways who's like humbled when you're speaking to me to be here. Meanwhile, I'm humbled to have you on here because you've accomplished so much in in where you lead. So um, this is just a conversation between friends, man, and, and, and the whole thing is that the people listening to the show, uh, they want to hear people's unconventional journeys to leadership. Um, You may think that there is so much that you may still have to achieve in your life. 
personally outside of wrestling whatever but you've achieved stuff that people can only dream of right so so we have to put it into perspective um so I want to start where we always start with these interviews uh, because this is a leadership-based podcast. Uh, I'm happy to do a deep dive. We've been doing some different episodes lately. We've been doing the, the LaunchCast leadership profiles, which are a little more truncated, shorter versions of the show uh, where we don't do as deep of a dive. Um, but this is one of our, our regular deep dive interviews. So we're going to start where we always start. Joe, are you a leader? Uh, I would say so. Yes, I'm a leader. Um, and that isn't something that happened overnight. And it's not something that I, I think about daily. It's when I hear it from those who I've, you know, so the life changing thing, uh, the whole character is kind of based on my real life. And that's, you know, we can get into that later. But, um, you know, as I started to progress in wrestling first, um, I had the opportunity to work at a wrestling school. I think that's where it all started for me is I was um, contacted, it was called FTW. Uh, the promoter at the time said, hey man, I'm looking for somebody to help run my Ronkonkoma school. Um, I've always gotten along with you, you're a good kid. You know, I'd only been wrestling at that point, let's see, 2010, about four or five years. So I was, you know, looking at it as an assistant role. Uh, Matt Stryker was also the head trainer there at the time too, who did the Queens and the Ronkonkoma location on Long Island. Um, I was contacted to do it. I got into the school and, you know, right away, I've always had a desire to help others. So I said, whatever I can offer, I'd be more than happy to. And that, that very quickly turned into, I became the head trainer of that particular location, Matt State in Queens. And I helped to really uh, develop a lot of the current re uh, independent wrestlers that are on the scene today. And man, that was really the start of my, my leadership journey. And it was uh, just kind of, like I said, thrown at me. I just wanted to do my best to help people. And that's how it just became what it was. Yeah, yeah, and I, I love hearing that. I wanna talk a little bit more about leadership and your definition of leadership. Right. I think a lot of us uh, sort of, you know, they, they, we compare our professional lives uh, or, or we use our professional lives as the example when we talk about leadership, but that's not always the case, right? Um, I, I have found throughout my journey, we talked a little bit about this before uh, the show, man, I've, I've been through the, the ringer to get to the place where I am now. Um, and for me, it was sort of discovering being a leader in my personal life was paramount to building the foundation that I have now as a leader in my in the business world, in my community, and you know everywhere where where I think I lead. So talk talk a little bit more about what leadership means to you in terms of the definition of leadership. Yeah, well, I mean, I think leadership for me it's um, leading by example. It's it's staying true to yourself and doing you know practicing what you preach. So if you have a goal in life, right? And let's say for me it was wrestling. It was a decision that okay, I'm gonna have to do things, uh, maybe sacrifice some social events, maybe you know, uh, miss a couple of parties, maybe, you know, whatever whatever the case may be. I knew there was gonna be things I had to sacrifice to focus my attention on my goal. If that's what I really wanna do, it's gonna take that extra effort, that work. And um, I guess the same thing could really apply anywhere though, whether it is my personal life or, or anybody else's personal life, it's that 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 focus um, and that, that will to to achieve something that might be unconventional that not everybody achieves, but it's it's the idea that hey everybody can. It's just putting that effort and work in. And for me, it's 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 seeing other people that notice that work, that see the effort that you put in, and that grow that is what gravitates people towards you. Well, this person's doing what they said they want to do. I in turn want to do something very similar. Right. Well, if this is the steps they're taking and it's working, I guess I should then jump on board and do what that person's doing. So that's how I've always kind of seen it in my head, at least. So, so I always, I always feel that somebody's, um, you know, end goal in terms of leadership always comes from the journey. So it's been interesting to sort of read about your story. Uh, I know we did a little bit of pre-interview stuff before this to kind of get the the background, since I like doing the chronology. Um, yes. that led to it. Um, so I want to kind of start at the beginning to, to give people an idea of where this all came from. So uh, let's talk about your childhood. You have defined your childhood from what I uh, surmise from everything you've, you've talked to me about by the fact that you were obese. Um, but the fact that I don't think a, a child typically looks at themselves in the moment and says, I'm obese. So when did you sort of become like self-aware to sort of realize it and, and start making a change? And how did that play a role in your life? Yeah, so, um, you know, there was, I had, a, I had a great childhood. I loved my parents, they were great. But there was a part of my life that was just, when I was really young, that wasn't so great. And I turned to two things, food and wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, and I was an only child too. 
Um, so I didn't have a lot of people to bounce back things off of. So those really, you know, food, food and wrestling were my two brother and sisters. That was yep. it. Um, so I, I started to realize the weight. Well, the weight issue I noticed because I got, I got picked on a lot. I was bullied. Yeah. Um, you know, especially in like elementary school. Um, and I, I think it was that. The bullying is what made me realize that I was overweight and I was different than everyone else. Not only could I see it, I heard it every day. Um, and then, you know, really for me, I remember, I want to say maybe I was like 10 or 11 years old and I was watching, you know, I was watching wrestling, obviously. I don't know if it was a Raw or whatever. And I'm looking at the guys that I really looked up to. I loved Ken Shamrock when I was young. So I loved that fit of rage he had. It was just so real in the UFC history. Uh, my dad was a big UFC fan from, like, the early days. Yep. So he was a good transfer over. I looked at Stone Cold. I mean, all these guys that I aspired to be like looked a certain way. And I realized looking at myself that... I was more look, likely to look like Yokozuna. No disrespect. <laughs> he's amazing and he's a fantastic athlete, but that's not who I wanted to be. Right. So then I started kind of looking into, all right, well, what are these guys doing? As I started getting into middle school, um, I noticed that they all had athletic backgrounds. I started getting, you know, I became, you know, I went from being a really young kid to understanding concepts in life, reading some of the magazines, reading some of the dirt sheets, seeing what these guys did. Um, and I'm like, okay, athletics. All right. Well, they started as a football player. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play football. I'm like, that's, that's a good start. And I'm gonna get into amateur wrestling. Those are two things that I really want to do. Um, and Kurt Angle happened to be. Uh, so the the long story short, when it comes to how I really started my journey into getting into real shape, is I started testing the waters of all these things. I started playing a little bit of football and like a PAL league, went pretty well. I started to trim out, yep. you know, and then I went to. Um, I went to East Middle High School, and there was the Jets Wrestling Club, and this is when I think I was like 11 or whatever. It was before middle school, like right before. And um, I was in the club, and there was a coach there by the name of Coach Pascarelli. It just so happened that he used to room with Kurt Angle in college. Uh-huh. Right, so, and this is when Kurt Angle just got on TV. Yeah. And there was a like a poster of him, and I was like talking to him about it. And he's like, oh, well, he's like, you know, he's like, that's a good person to look up to if that's what you really want to do, just so you know. He trains like an animal. Like, that's yeah. what he was telling me, you know, yeah. like as a kid. And I, I, I know why he was saying it. Like, if you do this, it's, it's possible for you, too. Got to do the work. Right, exactly. So I was a big fan of Kurt Angle, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to take these steps. So I decided I was going to be an amateur wrestler. I got into amateur wrestling in middle school, so a sixth grade hit. I was in. I'm like, amateur wrestling, I'm in. Um, started getting better. I told my parents, I'm like, I don't want fast food anymore, this, that. And I slowly but surely started to understand nutrition. But it, was, it wasn't it was just like overnight. It wasn't like, all right, yeah. I cut out fast food and all of a sudden I was ripped. It was, I started making better choices. I started understanding that these choices that I'm making are going to start to compile and get me towards my goal, being a pro wrestler, getting into WWE, whatever the case may be at the time. Um, yeah, and then, I, and, I, and then it was really that consistency of the athletics that I started to trim out, and people noticed it. I mean, middle school, right away, there was a different, I had a different respect from people because I looked so damn different than I did right. when I graduated uh, elementary school. And it just, and I liked that feeling too. I liked the feeling of, you know, cause now that I go back in time, I, the, another, I mean, I know I'm jumping a little bit. Reason I got into fitness is to help people have that same desire because there's nothing wrong with being whoever you are, whatever yep. your body image, just nothing wrong with that. It's just, for me, again, at the time, especially dating back to, you know, whenever this is early 2000s, that's just not what I wanted to be. And um, and, and it really, that that got me focused, it got me grounded, and I, I really, like, had steady progression from middle school through high school where I finally was. Right. I think I, I stopped, when I ended amateur wrestling, I was wrestling at 152 pounds. In elementary school, I was, like, 165. Yeah. So I closed wow. out high school lighter than I I closed out that's my elementary funny. school. Yeah, that's yeah, funny. That's how that happened. Um, so, so you said you were a junior high school wrestler, yep. and then in your junior year of high school, you sustained an injury. Yeah. Um, I know you said in your notes that this is kind of when your eyes open to professional wrestling as as an end goal. Yeah. How did that transition uh, to becoming a professional wrestler sort of happen? So, because it's one thing to be a high school athlete and participate in you know Greco Roman wrestling. And it's a whole other thing to decide to really lace up the boots and, and do it. Yeah. So what happened is this. Um, well, I had I had two. I, it's funny. My injuries all happen in weird places in life, and they're, they're few and far between, but they happen like back to back. So, um, sophomore year, I was 
qual- I was in the qualifier for counties and I was doing really well. I smoked the first two guys. Yeah. I get to my third match. This it, this guy tried to put me in like a headlock and I knew how to counter that very easily. And I went to do the counter and I felt something really weird in my groin, like pain, yeah. and I couldn't pop my hips. And yeah. I went down and he pinned me. And my coach is like, what the hell happened? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know, something's bothering me down there. He's like, all right. He's like, not to be weird, let me take a look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a hernia, and it oh. went all the way down. Wow. So it was bad. Yeah, I had to get surgery that week. It's wow. just a random freak thing. I was 15 years old. Um, so then I, I got into my junior year. Things were going good of high school. And uh, I had a shoulder injury. It was just this weird, you know, and it was supposed to be quick, and it, it went to my neck. And I, they weren't exactly sure what was wrong with me, but I had to take a little bit of time off. While I was taking that time off, I will never forget, one of my friends was having a house party, and normally I would have just been, you know, I think I thought we had a meet or something, but I, I was out, and I just went to this house. I'm like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to go to the house party, and let me let loose a little bit. I'm, you know, mentally, I was a little, you know, it was time to party. Let me have a little fun. I'm, I'm a little yeah, upset. Yeah. And I'm there, and then there was this guy, Dan, there, Dan Hickey. And he's like, hey, he's like, I heard you're a big pro wrestling fan. He's like, I actually know a couple of guys who used to do, you know, local independent shows. They have a ring at their house. He's like, you know, if you ever want to just come by and meet them, you know, he's like, you're cool. I like you. Come by. Yeah. So um, I got cleared and um, with the doctor. But even before that, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go head down. And I head down. Uh, I went down to the, the house that I was at. And they had the ring set up in the backyard. And it t- turns out two of the guys that were there used to, yeah, wrestle locally. They were trained by Balls Mahoney. Yeah. So they trained by a legitimate guy who was on TV. And they're like, yeah, if you want to come by and just, you know, roll around with us when you're healthy. You're more than welcome. Right. You're like, we'll, we'll teach you whatever you, you want to know. We'll have some fun. I'm like, oh, that sounds great. And I'll never forget the first time. So it was like months later. It was after wrestling season had ended. I was finally cleared. You know, everything was okay. And uh, I went in the ring, and I took my first bump. And I'll never forget this. In my <laughs> head, this is what I said to myself. If I die today, I'm happy. That's yeah. how in love I was with wrestling. And f- just taking that first bump, falling down for the first time, I knew that this is something that I I really, this is what I wanted to do. It wasn't just a pipe dream. It wasn't something I liked. It wasn't just this thing that got me to this goal. It was absolutely my life's passion to get there. Yeah. I love hearing that, man, because, um, you know, we we all sort of have these these passions in life and you kind of see something and you fall in love with it, whether it's a sport, whether it's, you know, whatever it is. Um, Being, you know, a lifelong wrestling fan, I, I know I know the vibe, um, and, and I'll, I'll be honest here, and, and, and you know this uh, a, a little bit, Joe, but um, way back, and this was like early in my career, probably a few years after you know, being out of college and stuff, I had, had, uh, I had gained a bunch of weight, um, lost it, and was looking for something fun to kind of keep me busy. You know? uh, and so I went down to one of these wrestling gyms, uh, schools really, um, and worked out there for a few months and took a couple of bumps and was like, this is this is fun. This is yeah. like, and being a, a guy that, especially at the time I was super into it, um, you know, my career was just budding and it actually popped in my head that this could potentially be a thing. You know, for me, it was never in the cards. And I kind of, at that moment had to be like, I just need to do this for a couple of months just to like have some fun yeah. and, and that's it. But yeah, taking my first bump, I was like, oh, this is crazy. And it's so funny because last night I was reminded of this. Do you watch? Uh, you have to watch it. Do you wa- watch Young Rock? Yeah. So Good uh, show. I don't know if you caught it last night, the new episode. But um, Young Rock, by the way, is a show on NBC, guys, that uh, it's Dwayne Johnson's show. And it's sort of the story of Dwayne Johnson growing up and how he came into the business and the whole thing. Um, they're up there in season two now, and they're up to the episode where – he asked his father to train him and takes his first bumps and, and whatever. And I'm sort of watching the episode and was like, this is crazy. Like, you get that really cool feeling. And it was very serendipitous that we have our interview today. Right. But I'm watching that last night. I was like, this is very cool, you know. But, yeah, it's, um, you know, I and, and I want to sort of talk about this for a minute. But tell me the moment, because I know this is now stuff that's happening to you as you're getting older and this is becoming a reality. But there is that kid in us that sees this for the first time and just falls in love with the thing. What was that moment for you when you were a kid? So I had watched bits and pieces of the build to WrestleMania 14, which was the when Mike Tyson came in. That's oh, a, yeah, yeah. It's a reason my dad decided, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, you know, let me, let me check this out, because he was, a, he was a, more of a boxing, he wasn't yeah, really yeah, a wrestling yeah. fan. And uh, WrestleMania 14, what officially hooked me, officially, because I watched the first half of the card, I saw The Rock and and, and Shamrock, and I was getting all excited. 
it was the Undertaker and Kane. Yeah. Those entrances. Yeah. And the just the whole like their attire. It was like literally watching a freaking comic book character come to life. I was hooked from that match on. That is all I wanted to watch. I was completely sucked in. That yeah. the entrances specifically is what re- I remember like my jaw dropping. I remember how my house looked be like back then, my, my, my family house, because of WrestleMania yeah. fourteen. Yeah. And then Austin and uh, Michaels closed the show and then Tyson knocked out Michaels. And I, I loved Shawn Michaels too. It was a shame he was gone for a couple of years after that. But that was really it. That day, that moment of just witnessing these characters at the grandest stage, man, I was completely hooked as a fan from that day going forward. Yeah. Yeah, for me it was it's funny because I was way too young when I first started watching. I was telling you before, I I was around for, you know, the yeah. Hogan, Macho Man, Ultimate Warrior, that whole era. I think year one WrestleMania, the first year was uh was twenty two so it was eighty four. So I actually watched the first WrestleMania. Yeah, you did. I watched the first WrestleMania, uh the second and the third, and I <laughs> I remember probably for like the first six, seven WrestleManias, I was just absolutely hooked and then i kind of not that i lost interest but i remember we moved from queens to long island to just different interests different friends and stuff and i remember as a as a young kid god i don't remember what t- what year it was but um my my buddy was a huge wrestling fan i went over his house for wrestlemania and or rumble maybe it was it was yeah. rumble i think and it was Shawn michaels and razor ramon the latter match oh wait wait no, that's wrestlemania 10 that was 10 and yeah. I remember going like, oh, man, this has changed. The game has yeah. changed a little bit, you know, because I hadn't seen it in a couple of years. The game has changed and, you know, kept an eye on it. But it was really during the Attitude Era of wrestling. Again, for those that don't follow wrestling here, I, I know I'm super nerding out on this. But <laughs> there's a reason for it. And we're going to talk about it in a little while because you have to sort of learn in life that when you have a passion, when you have something that you like, you don't have to age out of it. Um, you have to be conscious enough to sort of learn from the thing, right? So when I say learn from it, does that mean you're going to become a, a professional wrestler because you're a wrestler? No, that's not what it means. But I will tell you right now that I have learned, I've studied wrestling to the degree that I have learned that the art of wrestling, the curation, the cur- the choreography, and we talked about this a long time ago when we, you and I first started talking. Yeah. Um, the choreography, the art of wrestling, the art of telling a story through your emotions and sometimes through your words, it it is so ingenious and it has literally shaped how I speak publicly. It has shaped how I do this podcast, how I produce this show. Um, Besides the fact that, you know, I have two call outs to, to, to wrestlers, you know, I have the Ric Flair's woo as part of my intro, but I know that when you create community within the product you give, when I say create community, I mean like you, you give people things that they can get invested in. I have my taglines. I have my intro. I love that my son, who's not even allowed to listen to this show because it's explicit at times knows my entire intro by heart. And he will come into this office, sit at this microphone and do the thing by heart. And that other people that listen to the show, they know my intro. It it creates a sense of uh, investment that they have that that they know. It's an old friend, right? It's 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 their they know what to expect. They become part of it. Right. The Rock used to say we're not playing sing along with the champ. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's they become a part of it. It's it's this fandom that you can kind of create and they become champions for your product. You know, the people out there when you when you sort of do that and then the way you can look at wrestling and, and translate it to public speaking and controlling or how to control a crowd, how to uh, you know, how to evoke emotion, how to go in. I mean, people don't realize the work. Right. That goes into this sport. So to kind of piggyback off what you're saying, it, it this is the thing that people get lost on for a very long time. Well, you know, especially back in like the 40s and the 30s, and the, it was presented as a true athletic competition. Right. So people get right. hung up still in 2022 on, but is it? Are you really fighting? Uh, is it a real? Uh, isn't it fake? You hear that all the time, but like. It's almost, it's comical to me because like since Vince McMahon came out on air, I think in like 97 and said, yeah, you know, 
this is entertainment and we're saying this to you because we want to broaden the spectrum of what we can present in an entertainment uh, yep. you know, form. That's, that's when things got more elaborate with the entertainment part of things. But I think Freddie Prince Jr. said it best. And before I even get into that, it's, it's, you have to stop looking at it as a sport and think of it as live action theater because yep. that's essentially what it is. It, it's a physical form of live action theater. And Freddie Prince Jr. on his podcast, I'm a big fan of it, Wrestling with Freddie, he said he believes that pro wrestling is art in its purest form. It is literal blood, sweat, and tears on a literal canvas. Yep. And when he said that, I mean, that is exactly what it is. It's, it's, it, it's, it's telling stories physically that invoke emotion and get the fans emotionally invested in what is happening with the characters. And that's something that even takes a lot of pro wrestlers a long time to understand because when you first get into pro wrestling, you just want to do freaking everything. I guess it's like anything else in life. It's like you want to do all these cool moves and these flips and you want to use all the weapons and you want to do all these things. But what happens is you just wind up doing things just to do them, but that's not telling a story. So you might get a cool reaction in this match, but you know, people aren't going home remembering your name. When you get to that pinnacle as a performer where you're understanding that all the movements and all those all those components of wrestling are just there to add some, to be additives to your main portion, your main entree, which is you, that's when you finally really get it. That's what The Rocks understands. It's, that's what Ric Flair understood, Stone Cold. It's not about the match. It's about the person and what the person is doing. Yeah. And when you get there, then it's like, it's 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 money. It's butter. It's it's total money. And and again, I mentioned this uh, uh, about last night. If you want a, a a really good idea of what we're talking about here, seriously, go back and watch last night's episode of Young Rock. It was uh, we're recording this on April thirteenth, so it was the episode that came out April twelfth. It will kind of show you everything that we're talking about in terms of what's important in your training. Uh, for those that don't know, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, you know, former wrestler and legend in the WWE, now biggest movie star on the planet. His father was Soul Man Rocky Johnson. Mm -hmm. You know, huge, huge wrestler. His grandfather on his mother's side was High Chief Peter Maivia, mm -hmm. another legend. Uh, he's a third generation wrestler. When his father trained him, um, and again, I, I know that some of this, they took liberty, artistic liberties because it's a TV show, but I've read these stories before having read his books and stuff. Um, his father, he wouldn't, train him on moves like fancy moves it was all about bumps and selling mm -hmm. and selling for those that don't know is selling the consequence of the move right so if you get hit it's selling that you actually got hit again this is all we're not going to say fake this is choreographed this is orchestrated you know way back when they hit it they, they had this word kfeb that was uh am i saying it wrong kfeb kfeb yeah um it, it's it's a work, right? It's it it you know keep it keep it keep it under wraps. This is a secret. This is a secret. Mm -hmm. They think this is real. We know it's not, um, but not that it's not real because those hits are real. The moves are real. Yeah. The outcome is predetermined right. because it's a curated story, right? Yes. They're, they're trying to tell a story here and they're mm -hmm. trying to produce the best show. But um, selling. And, and making the thing believable. I've seen memes out there of the, the Rock like writhing yeah. in pain from a Stone Cold stunner. It's actually kind of funny how he was such an overseller sometimes. Right. But you believed what was happening in the match. You believed. Right. And yeah. and, to, and just to piggyback, it, it's the same as when you watch a really good movie. Especially like an action movie that's actually like has really good act acting yeah. and the action scenes are believable. It's that difference between you're watching a movie and you know you're watching a movie and you're watching a movie and you're kind of forgetting and you're like yelling at the TV then you have to like catch yourself. That's the same idea. If you sell properly, uh, the emotion, if you sell the moves properly, if you're doing what you're supposed to do in there and the story is so good, you'll forget that you're watching wrestling. You'll just be inv invoked in what's happening just yeah. like that excellent movie that yep. you saw. It's uh, uh, we had a conversation a while back. So Joe had reached out to me a while back. Uh, you, you guys know that I'm the executive producer of TEDx Farmingdale. Mm -hmm. I'm a three time TED speaker. Um, Joe had reached out because he wanted to get into into uh, public speaking and, and tell a story through TED um, and really was uh, reaching out as a student like he wanted to learn and. You know, hearing about his background and stuff and what he did for a living, I, I remember telling, I don't remember the exact conversation, but I do know that I was kind of telling you that your work in wrestling is literally the foundation of what you need 
to become a pro uh, a professional speaker because you know speaking is the same thing right i remember um there's a story that i've probably told on here before but the the day that my life changed as a public speaker was when i got on a stage of uh an event called speakers who dare with my my good friend trisha brooke was the producer of the show um speakers who dare was <clears throat> formerly tedx lincoln square i had applied i had this big talk called not just for profit uh probably to this day my the best talk i've ever done i think um big idea that i came up with it was supposed to be a ted talk they i got accepted but then the event wound up becoming a private event and left ted right um he transitioned to speakers who dare and trisha helped me in that moment learn about some of the theatrics that you need and hearing this i was like all right let me be a student here i've been speaking for years i've been keynoting stages but this is a different kind of talk and i took her advice and there were parts of the story that i didn't think were necessary she knew my big overall story and she told me to put a couple of parts in and i was like no i don't I don't think that needs to be here. That's like a, it's going to get me a cheap pop that I don't need. And she's like, no, I'm telling you, you know, this is part of a story that you're telling. It's important to the crowd. And there were two things that I learned there. One was that um, the way, the theatrics, the, the emotion that I put into the story in speaking was everything for me. And I called back to things like pro wrestling where I'm, I'm watching them tell a story. And I know when I pop, when I feel, I know this is all, predetermined but i sit there in that moment like it is happening for real because i want to be a fan and i'm i'm allowing myself to believe it in that moment and they're selling it so why not believe it why not experience it the right way right. so i learned that the theatrics and the way you do it was so important but then i also learned that the work that you put in ahead of time to mastering the fundamentals of of speaking in the same way you talk about putting the work in to, to become a great wrestler um, was so important. For us, it was committing to memory, right? It's not, you know, you put me on stage with two slides, I could talk for three hours, but a 10 minute talk that I fully memorize to the point where it's like reflex to me is gonna be so much better than anything, right? And in that moment, I did that talk and because I put the work in, because I was evoking emotion, I was telling my story, I was being authentic, that crowd was in the palm of my hands. It was, I remember this moment where there was a joke or there, there was something I delivered that when I was rehearsing it, I didn't know exactly how to deliver it and I just dropped it and the, the crowd reacted in a way that I didn't think they were going to. And from that moment, I could do anything I wanted. And I and dude, I closed the show, standing ovation. It was the best feeling I've ever had on a stage. And I knew in that moment exactly what it took to do this thing. And this is kind of what we talked about when we had that private conversation that you'll go on stage and you'll be great because you already have the fundamentals of this, you know? Uh it's just, you know, the subject matter you're gonna be talking about right, and stuff. So um but yeah, man, I, I, I could talk about this stuff all day long, but um, I want to get back to, to your story. Sure. But <clears throat> I do want people to understand that um, if, you, if you turn this on and you hear wrestling and you decide you're going to tune out because this isn't your typical show, don't tune out. This is something that is you're going to learn so much from this conversation that will make you such a better leader. It's so, so much better at what you're doing because you have to look at every thing out there whether it's wrestling whether it's speaking whether it's your career whatever whatever the thing is personal training um there's a, there's a certain way of doing it there's a certain amount of work that has to go into it and if you do that you could be you know successful at it so that's kind of the lesson here and what we're talking about but we'll get back to the story now so um you're invested you you, you met these people you start yep. training you talked about how you became the head trainer uh, in 2014 at the school yep. that you were training at. Um, how often at that time were you wrestling? Yeah, so yeah, I well, from, from the from, from meeting the guys that had the ring in their backyard, they referred me to NYWC. They said, you're actually good at this, you should do it. I trained there, um, I learned a little bit from Mikey Whipwreck, Crusher Dugan, rest in peace. Same place I trained, guys. Yep, same place. <laughs> uh, Pat Buck, who j recently just left OWE, he was there for many years. So I, I learned from a lot of really quality people. Um, I worked there for a bit, then I started traveling. I went to Jersey, North Carolina, all these different independent promotions that I could work for. And then I landed in 2014, that's when I, so the way that happened is um, Evolve wound up being a 
company that WWE worked with exclusively to get talent. That that's no longer you know in existence, but at the time it was, and there was also Dragon Gate USA, which was connected. So it's a whole WWN Live family. I had done a tryout for WWN Live, the Dragon Gate show, um, and I was I, I impressed. That's where that promoter, his name is Ryan Idol now. He was running and supervising the the tryouts. And he knew me from my past. We we crossed paths before. I was in good shape, yep. and I had a good impressive match. And that's how that started. So I went to the wrestling school um, in 2014 from there to help train his students. Um, and then I'm so sorry I got lost from there. What was the question? Oh, we were talking. How, how often did you wrestle? Oh, okay, that good. Time? Thanks. So yeah, uh, <laughs> I was wrestling just about every weekend, um, which is where I'm basically getting back to now. But yeah, just about every weekend I was in the ring at some and to, to perform in front of a crowd, which is. Probably the most important thing to do once you understand the fundamentals is you got to get in front of the crowd. Like you were saying, you have to start to learn different crowds because you're not always appeasing to oh, the yeah. same crowd. There's the really smart fans who really appreciate the athletics and they, they're like in the know like you are. They're in the know. They know how it works and they want to see badass guys kicking the crap out of each other and doing all these athletic moves and on top of a good story. Then you have crowds that are more family friendly and you have grandma there who doesn't really know wrestling and then you gotta tone back the athleticism and turn up the entertainment right. and get them to really hate the bad guy. And you don't have to do that much to get the same kind of reaction. So that's why I was wrestling every weekend in front of different crowds to really hone my craft and understand how to manipulate the emotions of all these different audiences. And then there's an art to being a good guy and there's an art to being a bad guy. So the, the more time I was in the ring performing, the better. And on top of that, I was training in the ring um, at least twice a week, teaching the students on top of getting yep. in the ring. And that's about three hour sessions, I would yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. A lot of work to get there. Um, uh -huh. I, I want to I move for a minute to, to something uh, that we call spark moments on the show. So cool. spark moments, um, these are moments in life that good, bad, or indifferent, they lead you down a path and they kind of uh, uh, set you on, on this path that will not not necessarily determine your life, but determine what the next step is for you. There are these big, big moments. So 2016, after you wrestled with Evolve, yeah. um, you had your injury. Yep. Uh, and, and and we talked about it before, but there these injuries for you throughout your career mm -hmm. have been at very like crucial times, and they all kind of set you on a path. So talk about that, that first moment, yeah. uh, so, that first injury. Yeah, let me get into that. So um, 2015, things were great. I really built a name. 2016... Uh, it was a, it was a weekend, so I actually have to go back just one day or that the weekend before I was wrestling in a show called Big Time Wrestling in um, I oh, forgot yeah, what Big we're, Time Wrestling. I think we're in PA. I could be wrong. I think it was PA. And so yeah, it, they I, I wrestled in the first uh, the first half of the show. I think it was second match. I'll never forget. The Sting was walking backstage and just like pats me on the back. It's good luck out there, kid. And now I get chills. Holy cow! And there's like there's like an, over a thousand people. It was a big venue. Had a triple threat match. It went excellent. And Tommy Dreamer was watching. And he, he starts talking to me after the match. And he goes, hey, um, he goes, listen, the, there's one guy who's supposed to be in the main event match with me tonight against me, and he didn't show up tonight. I'd like you to do it. Can you stay? <laughs> yeah. The match was against Raven, oh, Sandman. Geez. Wow. I think it was Sabu and Tommy. So it was an ECW <sighs> and legend and I got to match. Watch, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> and I only got in there with Tommy for a little bit, and it didn't matter. It was awesome. He really liked me. Then it was a couple of days later after that. Um, I w and the way that Evolved worked was I've been trying to get in there for a while. Yeah. After the Dragon Gate USA, I'd done some pre-shows. And um, there was a guy, Speedball Mike Bailey. I'll never forget. He's excellent performer. Something happened with his work visa. And he couldn't come to the United States at the time. He had to stay in Canada. I don't know why. Oh, wow. So there was somebody else who was another... Um, it was another replacement. He couldn't be there. So then it was me. I had four minutes. I was out there with Ethan Page. Four minutes. And Ethan's a really cool guy. He's like, all right. He's like, listen, you can hit one or two things. He's like, let me know what you want to do. I told him. And I went out there, and William Regal was watching. And I saw him when I entered. And um, the match went really, really well. For the four minutes, I made enough of an impression that there were fans online saying, hey, and I, I performed as Jack Gallo for many years. Uh -huh. So there was fans saying, hey, I don't know much about this gal guy, but he looks like he belonged. And Regal pulled me aside, gave me pointers, but was really happy. Three days. So this was on Saturday. The Wednesday after, I went to the Queens Wrestling School to, to sub in, which I normally don't. And I'm teaching basic clotheslines. And it's just shuffling to your right, shuffling to your left. I shuffle, and all of a sudden I hear... <coughs> And I thought one of the boards came up and hit me in the back of the foot. I'm like, yo, guys, what is that? I'm allowed to curse, right? Yeah. And I'm like, and I got like, man, I'm like, guys, what the fuck just hit me in the leg? And I went to step and then my weight gave out. 
Went to step again. My weight, I'm like, this isn't good. Rolled outside. Um, to give the long story short, I tr yeah. I, will try, I worked in an office job uh, part time, and I was trying to walk. And this one guy's like, "Yeah, you should probably go to the hospital." Yeah. Um. And yeah, my Achilles was torn at 24 uh, years old. Yeah. Geez. Um. So yeah, and then um, go, did you, to to well to 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 go off that. So this happens in March of 2016. So I I go to the doctor, and um, he tells me the you know it's torn, and I'm talking to my PT because I had to get PT, and they're telling me it's gonna be a year. And I'm like, and I knew that my PT is a friend. I'm like, yo, how, how, what's the quickest recovery time? He's like, Joe, come on. What's the, I'm like, what's the fucking quickest? Yeah. Tell me the truth. He goes, I've seen people do it in four months. I'm like, four months, I'm going to get this done. Yeah. And I just put my life to the side and goes back to leadership, right? And the idea of I'm going to set this goal and I'm going to do it. Right. So I, I, I set everything to the side. I got on my crutches and I went to PT five times a week and I did anything I could to recover. Right. And I was cleared to go in six months. Wasn't four. But six is still early. That's six months less than yeah. most. And I'm feeling good. And I'm starting to deadlift again. I was up to 400. And I went to 450 pounds. And it's a lot. But my, I was all good. And it was the first time I deadlifted without my PT there. And I was already mentally a little bit down. But I was okay. Like, it hurt me. I had some moments where I was a little down. But I'm like, okay, I can do this in six months. My momentum was still kind of there. Um, and let me explain that. This is really important. The reason I was so devastated about the injury is it's really hard to get momentum in wrestling. Yeah. Once you have it, if you lose it, it could be a problem. So getting into Evolve, that first step, so the, the, the audience here understands, it's like not, you know, I wasn't like a regular featured person that, okay, when, when you come back, you're definitely having a spot. It's like, I needed to do that a couple of more times to maybe become a regular, to maybe get the ball rolling. Right. So my momentum was just getting, I was like, I was like going up the, uh, going up the roller coaster, but I hadn't hit the yep. top yet. So I'm like, all right, six months, and I still had some people that wanted, and, and all the local companies aside that now wanted to build their companies around me. So championships, and in wrestling, it basically means you're the feature attraction. You're not obviously beating anyone for it, but you are, when someone looks up a company, if you're the champion, you're going to be the poster child. It's like getting a, getting a promotion, right? Right. So six months in, I'm doing a deadlift. All of a sudden, I hear a snap. I tore my right bicep. Another five to six months. The problem with this is mentally at that point, I went into a really, 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 really bad place because I knew it's like I felt like everything that I had worked literally my life for since I was maybe seven years old just got ripped from my hands. Um, I did my best to recover. So now it was about a little over a year I was out and uh, I came back and like my first match was good. It was, you know, and everything was OK, but a lot of the opportunities weren't there. And I don't know if anyone else has experienced this in life, but just not having those opportunities there, it just, my confidence went down a little bit. And then I had another match. It was a one-on-one, -on -one and it was like, okay. It just wasn't like what I would normally, yeah. you know, whatever. So my confidence went down a little more. Then I had a triple threat match, and like everything that could have possibly went wrong in this match went wrong. Yeah. Like one guy got like, would hurt. The other guy like forgot a spot or a place that he was supposed to be, and things looked messy. And then my boot ripped. Like... And I couldn't walk. It was just like anything you can imagine. Everything was going yeah. on. Yeah. So that was about 2017. So I had some like good moments, bad moments. But at the same time, again, these opportunities weren't there. It was hard to, it was a hard pill to swallow because I was in shape. Yeah. And then this was my, this was my exit for a while. There was, so WWN, getting back to that family where Evolve is associated with. They had a show. So this is how this happened again. Um, I was wrestling a show on Saturday and they had, they do a show after. So that's how it was. We we wrestled on a show that was during the day, and they had their night show. Yep. And Sal, who was one of the um, owners, came up to me. It was on a Saturday night. I'm wrestling this match. Everything's going well. All of a sudden, there was an accidental headbutt, and I cut my eye open. I'm here to here. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, it wasn't a big deal. I'm going to go get stitched up. But then uh, I was supposed to work the next day. Sal comes up to me and goes, hey, man, we'd like to use you on the show tomorrow if you can make it. Really? Like now you tell me yeah. <laughs> like you want to use me on the show tomorrow. So I'm like, uh, you know, I'm like, yeah, of course, obviously I'll be there. And this was a, an, an event event in Queens. So I'm thinking that the event's going to be in that same location the next day. And I was just rushing to the hospital, to get this stitched up. And then I'm trying to find coverage for my job uh, that I worked at at this, you know, my, my, my regular nine to five job, whatever. And so I go, I get my eye stitched back up. I finally found one person to cover. It was like a nightmare. It was like an all night thing. I found someone to do it. And, uh, and it was Sunday, so I had the show, and I'm, like, driving over to the show. And, um, and I get to the venue, and there's no one there. So I call, the, I call like, a mutual friend, 
And I'm like, hey, man, I'm like, uh, I'm at the venue. Uh, where, where is everyone? He goes, dude, it's in Brooklyn. <laughs> and if and being late is a big, big sure. no-no. You want to be early. And I would have been early, but, you know. I, sure. And I remember I was so defeated. I called the guy who helped. I'm like, dude, just I, I just want to say I got an ex. I don't even want to go. He's like, no, 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 go. I'm like, no, dude, it's better off to say, like, make anything up. That's how, like, that's how, ner and this is, the, again, this is my me mental sure. space. I was just so, like, I'm like, no, I, I don't even want to go. So I'm just like, all right, I'll go. I get there. And um, I had a match just, again, just wasn't good. It wasn't what I, I mean, for me, it wasn't my level. Um, I still feel bad for the guy I worked with because it wasn't, I, I still want to wrestle him again because I can give him something so much better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at that point, it didn't matter. Um, I showed up late. I didn't perform at my best. Um, and I remember I drove, I left the building that day. It was with my fiance now, my girlfriend at the time. I looked at her, I said, I just want to go back, be with the family. I want to eat whatever I want to eat. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to stick to fitness for now. Yeah. You know? And I was just, at that point I thought I was done. Yeah. You know? And it was hard to say, but I just, you know. And now a word from our sponsors. Well, that's a nice song. Hey, hey, everybody. It's me, the launch dad himself, George Andriopoulos, the host of the LaunchCast, the co-host of Over My Dad Podcast. But more importantly, I'm here today on behalf of Launchpad 516 Studios, the podcast production company that makes those two shows, the one you're listening to now, and so many others possible. Now, what is Launchpad 516 Studios? Well, it's the brainchild of Launchpad 516 it's a podcast production company, and we help you from conceptualization to production to recording to post-production to monetization. The key word here, let's turn that hobby, that idea into a revenue stream. But more importantly, let's get that important idea out there and get your voice heard because that's what matters right now. Hit us up, launchpad516studios.com to find out more information. Or send us an email, podcast at lp516.com. DM me at Launchpad CEO on all the platforms. Let's chat. Let's get your voice heard. We're pretty good at this, guys. Don't let this offer slip by you. Later, guys. Beep, beep, beep. We are interrupting this show to tell you about our podcast with a very special announcement. Hey folks, I hope you're enjoying your podcast which you're listening to right now, but I would like to tell you about another one. We are Sounds Like Autism. Produced by Launchpad 516 Studios. Which is full of impactful programming. It's the podcast that celebrates neurodiversity by speaking to the people who are helping to create a more inclusive world. I am Dave Thompson. I am an educator and an innovator and a leader within the space of helping the world become a more inclusive place for neurodivergent people as a neurodivergent self-advocate myself. And my co-host, Josh Mursky, is an incredible, hardworking, big picture dude who is on the autism spectrum and super stoked to spread his message of inclusion along with me. We've had folks on from all over, all walks of life, all over the country, and more. You don't need to be someone who is autistic yourself or have skin in the game. You don't need a family member or a neighbor who is autistic. You probably have one, but you don't need any of that to get stoked on neurodiversity and inclusion. We're confident that if you give us a shot, if you join us on our journey, that you'll be a lifer and you'll be fully invested in this mission. We are just so delighted and honored to have this kind of platform to share with you all what we do check us out i hope you enjoy your current podcast and then after that skedaddle and come right over here to sounds like autism and check us out now back to the show how did your uh, i'm curious how did your family uh react to all this what, what kind of support did you have from your family yeah you know they're always supportive um might not have understood it 100 percent as to why but always supportive um my mom and dad always said go for it but they also always wanted me to have something else. i think that's Probably any parent, sure. you know, and, 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 you know, the one thing I will say that I've learned over the years is, and this is what the injuries taught me. So th th this does have a positive outcome. As you can see with all my gold, there's positive. <laughs> outcome. Um, I, I learned through those injuries. I always thought I was Superman and I realized even though I love this and I can do this as a profession, I can't do it until I'm a hundred. Yeah. You know, there's a window of an, as an athlete and pro wrestlers lives are usually a little longer as an athlete. Uh, you can get away with it, but it's not very long. And it made me realize that I do need other things in my life that I have after. Not 
instead of after. And after. I wish that somebody presented that idea to me a little bit more thoroughly when I was younger. But even though everything happens the way it's supposed to happen, um, that's been the big eye opener for me was that you have to have other things that you can do in life. And my parents did always want, but they used to use the wrong words. They would be like, hey, backup plan, backup. I'm like, backup. I'm like, there's no backup plan. That's bullshit. Yeah. I have a plan. I'm going to effing do it. Don't tell that. You're basically telling me I can't. Yeah. But they've obviously, they helped me get into the wrestling schools. Um, you know, they, they always came to my shows or told everyone to come to my shows. Um, my other, like my Uncle Kenny to this day, I love my Uncle Kenny. He's an accountant. And he always said, I'm so proud of you for going after your dreams. He's like, you know, I, he's like, I, I didn't want to be an accountant when I was five. You know what I mean? He's like, so I'm proud of you for, for doing what you do. Um, and, and like my, you know, my fiance now, she is always upset when I walk in sore or beat up. But yeah, other than that, so supportive. She got to understand wrestling herself, which is so cool. Uh, she'll watch it with me. She, you know, she, she comes to the show. She helped do the door at one of the shows recently. That's great. So it's awesome. And I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm lucky to have somebody who supports me. When that's I do. great. Yeah. 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 That's everything. Yeah. Honestly, that's everything. Um, so you got a call. Yep. Uh, in, in 2019 from your yeah. old partner. So, uh, yeah. some people might know him. He's, he was on, um, he was on a show. His name is Jason Carrion. He was on a reality TV show before. I'm not going to get into details of it, but he's, he's, you know, he's, so he, at the time, um, he, he actually went through a divorce from his first wife. Um, and he gave me a phone call uh, in 2019. He was like, hey, man. He's like, yeah, so, you know, how's everything going? I'm like, good. You know, I was, in, I was in the fitness industry, and that was doing really, really well for me. And, you know, he goes, you know, why don't we, uh, like, you want to get, get a match in or two? I'm like, I'm like, I don't know, man. He's like, he's like come on, man. He's like, why don't we just, he's like, he's like, you know, he's like, you're too good to be sitting around. And I, I, my confidence was gone as a wrestler at this point. That's really the truth. My confidence at that point was was lost. It wasn't that I didn't want to do it. It was lost. And I kept saying, I'm like, I don't know, man. Because he was, and it's not like he really needed me at the time either. Because he was doing well. He was doing tours in Europe and stuff. But he was insistent. He's like, no, I want to do this with you. Like, you know, I miss yeah. you. You know, he was out for a couple of years after he was doing the show and he was married. And he really, you know, he wanted to get back in. So I'm like, all right, if you really believe I belong in there, okay, well, let, let's do this. And um, you know, we, we wrestled as Team Torment, and then we changed to Team Talent. And um, we got back out there, man. We went back to Warriors of Wrestling, Staten Island. was like our first spot. That's where we started together. And uh, I hadn't been there in years, and it was really cool because it was like, all right, let's just let's go back there. It's back home. We know all the guys. Uh, we knew the promoter. And uh, it started to just kind of like, you know, like, like life happens. I started finding myself in there again, found my groove. I was in great shape. We started uh, expanding a little bit, going more into Long Island again. I did some shows around here with him. And, um, yeah, things just started snowballing and snowballing and snowballing. Um, and then I, you know, I started getting the itch so bad that even when we didn't have singles uh, tag bookings, I started taking singles bookings again. And that's around the time that Full Faith started. Um, and the guy, Mike Magnum, runs um, Full Faith. He's a really good friend of mine. And... You remember he told me he's like, "Hey man, I, I, you know, I want you to be my first champion here," and I was like, "Really? I'm like, you, you think?" Yeah, he's like, "He's like, I think I know. Like, yeah, he should be." And um, yeah, I remember it was a match against Matt Striker, awesome guy. Really, another guy who really brought my confidence. I'll Bayside, you former Bayside High School teacher. Bayside. <laughs> and you know, I'll tell you a story about that day that I. So he came out to me in the locker room, and, and the, these are the little things that started to happen. I guess this really kind of tra translates now into the heart of the show. Yeah. Knowing my worth and realizing the impact I've made postpartum. Yeah. So I was in the locker room and Stryker comes up to me and he's like, yo, you know, Jack, Joe, whatever. He goes, hey, man, listen. He goes, you know, when I was tricked, because we didn't have a lot of contact when we were the wrestling school. He was just, he was in Queens. I was in Long Island. Sure. He's like, I want you to know that all the students would come to Queens on Wednesday after training with you on Tuesday. And they would say something about psychology or in-ring stuff. And I would shake my head and I would look at them and say, who told you that? How do you know this? And they would say it was Gallo. He's like, I just want you to know I have an absolute immense amount of respect for you. That's great. And I, I almost cried. I was just, to feel the respect from somebody who's been on WWE TV, for those of you who don't know, he was on TV, he was a commentator, um, you know, someone I respected. I started getting this back. The students that I used to train that were on that show were coming up to me saying, hey, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here, so thank you. And you start hearing this, and it's like I started to remember who I really was. Yeah. I started remembering I, I do belong here. And, you know, I needed my time away, 
But usually, as happens in wrestling, I got sucked back in. And I won the championship that night. Um, but I wasn't primarily a singles wrestler, though. Still focused on tag wrestling. Yeah. And but so we started putting feelers out, Jason and I, to all these different companies. Um, and he got a message back. He was going back and forth at AEW at the time, and he had a, he had received an email. Hey, we're going to keep you guys in mind, which was big, which hopefully meant, oh my god, it's going to happen soon. And then the pandemic hit. Yeah. And during this time, during the pandemic, right before the pandemic, he got married to his second wife, who was it's awesome. Um, and during that time, he he actually had now as his first baby. My uh, well, tech word, Jason. So it's it's awesome. Oh, nice. Son. Yeah, yeah, he had a kid. Very so, cool. Um, while this was always all going on, he kind of made some decisions for himself that he needed to spend more time with his family, which I absolutely, totally. of course, man. He just had a baby, just got married, um, and he's super happy. He's doing well. Um, so then it was post pandemic time. Of what am I going to do? And this is where everything changed for me. So. The one thing I will say is this. I wrestled as Jack Gallo for all these years. At one time, I was the protector of professional wrestling, anti-sports entertainment guy. Yeah. And I was out, and then I just became a guy. I was undeniable Jack Gallo. But someone once asked me this question. I couldn't answer it. And that's when I realized I needed to change something. He goes, well, who is Jack Gallo? I'm like, uh, me. <laughs> He's yeah. like, well, what, what? And, like, you know, yeah. and it made me realize I don't really have a character. I could talk. I could do all these things. My wrestling was great. But who the heck am I? Right. So that's when I made a decision that was really hard to make, but I thought it was necessary. I'm like, I'm going to start using my real name. Yeah. And I'm going to take elements of my real life and I'm going to apply it to this character. And that's when I decided I was going to go with this new route of being the life changing yeah. Joe Cassio. Yeah. I love yeah. that, man. It's, it's such a great character for you. And uh, uh, yeah. just to rewind for two yeah. seconds, because I want to talk about passion. You were talking about Matt Stryker yeah. before. Yeah. Um, I worked in Whitestone for many years, which is right next door to Bayside. So this was like big news back then. But I remember reading the story about this high school teacher at Bayside <laughs> High School that got fired because he took a day off of work to wrestle yep. and they got fired and literally the next day is when he got signed by yep. WWE. Yep. And he was a wrestler for a little while before he became a commentator on, on SmackDown. Yes, I think yes, he was. yes. Um, but yeah. To, he had like a 10-year tenure there. He had a long... He was there for a while. Yep, he wrestled for I think maybe the first half and then he went into commentary for the last half which is such an awesome yeah. place to be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Amazing. yeah. And he got, amazing. that's a true story. He got fired for taking a day off to um, be- Before we, yeah. we move on to your uh-huh. current character, I just want to touch real quick, you know, pandemic, we have to change focus I'm sure there wasn't really much wrestling going on. Yeah. Uh, talk about Joe's results, though. Yeah. Let me get into that. I, this, so that was, um, so I worked for a major company for many, many years in boutique fitness um, where I had a microphone and I would train a bunch of people at the same time. Uh, perfect fit for me. Uh, you know, uh, that was what a good friend of mine was a minority partner in this business, and he's the one who suggested I do it. I was there for many years, and when I first stopped wrestling, I took a management role in this company. Um, but what I did realize, you know, some throughout that process of being in the management side of the uh, fitness industry for the company I worked with is that I was never going to find my end goal. I, there was never going to be terms that I was going to be comfortable with putting the rest of my life to the side to solely focus on that. I just knew that those terms financially, security-wise, probably were not going to exist. So when the pandemic hit, um, well, at first what happened was, I mean, I wasn't really training anybody. I wasn't doing any. I mean, my, my, my father's a plumber. I'm definitely not one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know he had some jobs and that was you know he was uh you know he was he was still able to and had some some work to do so i would go and i would assist him on these jobs and then um i had a couple of people ask oh would you do some outdoor stuff and i said yeah, yeah i'll do some outdoor stuff sure and i you know i still had some private clients so kind of going back a little bit there were some people i have that i tr- that go to their house and train them sure. while i worked for this big company but it was few and far between so i was so busy um, so, and then a couple of those people didn't even want to do that because pandemic. Yeah, sure. So I started with the outdoor workouts and, um, they were hit. People really enjoyed it. So we're going to like the park, went to my local elementary school, running uphill, doing all kinds of stuff just to stay active. And, um, and then I started getting more inquiries and more inquiries and more inquiries. And, um, you know, I, I'm like, okay, I'm like, well, it's getting, it's about to get cold again and yep. I, I can't, I can't stay outdoors but I had, you know, I have this garage, and it was just an old garage, wooden, a whole bunch of junk uh, in the garage, stuff that my dad gave to hoard. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm like, you know, I'm like, I have all this space. I'm like, I know equipment's expensive because I didn't have much equipment, but I'm like, you know, 
I have two options. I can go back to doing what I was doing before, and I knew that I truly wasn't happy, and I knew that being back in wrestling especially, I'm not going to be as much in control of my destiny. Sure. So if I want to be in control of my destiny, there's only one way to do that, and that's to take this really scary chance at opening my own business. So I took a, a big chunk of my savings, most of it, and I renovated. I have a huge garage. I, I renovated yep. it into a full gym with mats, assault bikes. Yeah, it looks rowers. great, man. I've yeah, seen it's it. awesome. Yeah. yeah, and I'm just like, screw it, and I went for it. And um, man, it's it's amazing. You know, a lot of I thought I was going to let a lot of people from my former employer that maybe wanted to come on, but uh, it wound up being one of those things. Where, and I never advertised too. That was the thing. I never advertised because I. I was I was almost unsure of how it was going to go or, or what I could handle, so I'm like I'm just going to have people come to. Yeah, me. you don't want to go too nuts. Just right, right. So yeah. I would just I would just post some stories of me training people, and I saw what happened, and um, it was one of those things where one person would you know word of mouth tell their friend, and and so community, right? So let's get into how that all kind of developed, because I kind of went the word of mouth route. These people who would come to the group sessions that I would do. Yep. Even if they didn't know each other, because they knew that person that was there before, and that, like, let's say, Tam and Jana are friends, and now Tam brought Murph in, and now because Murph is Tam's friend, she's now Jana's friend. Everybody became like a little family, and yeah. that's what I have. You know, I stay very private in the sense of the groups are very small. Yep. I don't let anybody just in, and, you know, knock on wood, I mean... It's just, it's been an upward trend since. It's amazing. The community that I've built there, the people that I have. I, I mean, and I have people of all, you know, I have the oldest person I work with is 80. The youngest person I work with is 17. So I work with different people, different age groups. And I'm blessed with the experience I have working in the big franchise boutique fitness um, industry because I learned how to work with people of varying skill levels at the same time. And that's where I've really hit my niche on top of having my private clients that I go to and I have come to me one on one. Um, and it's just been a blessing, man. You know, I, a lot of a lot of people ask me, well, do you want to go and open a franchise business and stuff? And the answer really right now is no. I'm just so happy in the setting that I have because it allows me to continue to hit my life's passions yeah. and really go for it. Because that was the one thing I did not want to negotiate on. I'm like, hey, listen, the other thing I realized I turned 30, uh, 2021, which is still very young. Yeah. But at the same time. If for an athlete's window, the clock is ticking. Yeah. So if I'm going to continue to do this, if I'm really going to do it now, is is the only time. Good for you, man. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, we're going to put uh, the, the link to Joe's Results Zone, uh, awesome. the website, in the show notes. Uh, I'm going to put some videos of you up there, some links to uh, uh, your bio and all Love that it. stuff. Um, what do we cover here? So, so uh, I want to go back real quick before yeah. we start wrapping up on. Uh, uh, this new version of yourself, where yes. really the the real version of yourself now in wrestling, yeah. uh, maybe an exaggerated version, but yes. um, authenticity. That's yeah. kind of the one thing that I, I, I see in this. So when we talk about life changing Joe Ocasio, um, there's authenticity in that. I have seen, and look, the, the wrestling business, for those that don't know, um, wrestlers, when they get to a certain level of success don't often have full control of their personas too yes. right uh i just read a, a super interesting story on uh cody rhodes so cody rhodes uh, son of uh wrestling icon and legend dusty rhodes um his brother dustin runnels played the character gold dust in, in wwe for years since wwf years and years and years um Cody played Cody Rhodes, right? He took on the same last name as his dad's uh, 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 wrestling name. But, you know, he was kind of himself for a while. And he, he was okay when he was younger. Uh, great wrestler. Nothing nothing to speak of on the mic. Um, and then WWE switched his gimmick to something called Stardust, which was like a, you know, a... a the same gimmick as gold dust, but different colors and, and stuff like that. Right. Which is a very flamboyant. Yes. Like makeup, just the opposite of what his father was, a, a gritty blue collar right. person. Right. Hard work. Right. Yep. How about uh, they, yeah, they yeah. Roll with American dream. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, funny. I just watched his uh, Hall of Fame induction speech the other day. Great. Um, but anyway, so so. Cody Rhodes goes on to leave WWE in 2016, goes to AEW when they were first starting, was executive vice president for that, like the whole thing and helped build the company, but also literally became the best version of himself that he's yes. ever been. The American Nightmare just came back to WWE. And I read a story that 
it was in his contract that they can never even say the name Stardust to him ever again right. <laughs> because he hated it so much. So yeah. we don't uh, uh, wrestlers don't often have uh, uh, any full control over their personas, but right. you being able to switch up the gimmick and and just right. be you and, and take on this whole thing of, of life changer, it must feel like it's a a a, a perfect fitting shirt, right? Like it yeah. just it works. It, it was scary, you know. And I, I look at someone like Cody Rhodes, and for those to understand his situation, he still was walking away from like millions. I, I think he was up there, close to like a million. He had a, he was making a lot of money doing the Stardust character. Yeah. So he took the chance at himself by walking away from that money and security to then try to find his true self and come back. So his success story for that reason that now he's more popular than ever and making that money, having that deal is unbelievable. Yeah. But for me, it was less risk in the sense of I'm not walking away from something that's been, you know, whatever. Sure. But it was scary because I spent my whole career as Jack Gallo. Many people knew me as Jack Gallo. Um, but I, I, I knew in my heart that even if I did this new character as Jack Gallo, it wouldn't be the same. I'm like, you know, and I, I always found it funny that people never acknowledge that they use a stage name. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to be authentic about this, I'm going to, so this all started here. To, let me actually take it back a little bit further. I had done this shoot promo and I say it's a shoot promo because I had um, this guy coming to film commercials for my gym. And in the deal, I said, hey, I want to do this wrestling promo, but I'm just going to kind of talk from the heart. I'm going to let a lot of shit out. Yeah. Because the thing that hurt me the most, and, and the other part about all this is, while I was taking that time off, a lot of my peers are getting signed to contracts. Yeah. And that was really, really, and I'm, I'm not jealous. Like, I'm very happy for them to this day. But it was really hard for me to watch that, knowing I'm sitting on my ass. These are people that I'm in the same camp as. Like, yeah. we, are, we are equals. Yeah. And they're getting the opportunities and they're on TV and they're living the dream and I'm home. So I basically, and this is before the life changing thing came out. And um, I remember I started the promo with, like, I'm really fucking mad at myself. Yeah. And I cursed and I said, I didn't care. It wasn't like, you're not really supposed to curse. But I, I didn't care. It was just me actually venting just in the setting as, of pro wrestling. And I went in and I discussed and I, and I, and I remember in this promo and I'll send it to you and you can put it up if you want yeah. to. I said, it's, I'm like, I watch it and it's my fault. I'm not there. It's it's my fault, and um, you know I, I you know I don't even know the particulars of what I said because it just came from the heart, but that's really was the was the snow because that's when I said I'm gonna, I'm dropping the stage name I'm gonna be Joe Cassio that's how that started it was just I'm dropping the stage name I'm gonna be the real me I'm gonna start speaking up I belong and you're gonna see the real me now yeah then um, there was this basketball charity game this guy Shane Fair he's awesome he's an announcer. Uh, a commentator, not a commentator, I'm sorry, he's a ring announcer. He was doing this charity baseball game in Jersey, and um, there was a, a good guy team and a bad guy team. I always envisioned myself just being a good guy. Yep. Uh, Joe, the Joe Ocasio, but it had to be a bad guy. And then I sat there and thought about it, cause for, for, the, for, the, for the basketball game, but I'm like, I'm like, wow. I'm like, you know, my whole character, who I am, is somebody who really goes out of my way to help people um, get in better shape. I've helped people in wrestling. I just, I, 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 you know, I, my grandfather was an orphan. Um, and I've always wanted to give back. If I always like when I, when I pray to God, everyone or the universe, whatever, when I pray, I always say, if, if, if success happens for me, I will give it back. That's what I've always said to the universe. And it's true because I've always had this desire to give back to orphanages. Cause my grandfather came from yep. there. I've had desires to give back to underprivileged children. It's just, it's just something that's been there for me. Special needs children. My, um, adopted brother is special needs. But I'm like, okay, what if I take this idea of being somebody who helps people, being a good person, but I, I flip it. I'm like, what if I'm this guy who helps change people's lives for the better, but secretly I'm just manipulating all of them yeah. to get me to the level of success that I want. Sure. And I'm like, this would actually be pretty freaking cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I filmed this series of vignettes uh, where it's like it starts with just looks like a gym commercial. And it was very close. Like my, my fiance is like, you sure you want to do this? Because people might just think you're a cult leader. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so it starts all these like little people saying, oh, you know, yeah, all these little clips of like people like, oh, you know, we changed my life. I, I got in better shape. And then it started getting weird. Like this guy's like, yeah, I signed the deed of my house to him. And it was like like almost funny, but like what's going they on? They were good. They I've were, seen you some saw, of these right? vignettes. Like, yeah, they were good. They were, but it was like it started getting weird. Weird, and it's like you're watching as a viewer, just each one. And my buddy James Morano, who is awesome, he does commercials like he I, he does everything. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. really lucky that he came and did this for me, just because he's a good friend. Um, 
And then I had this actress, Nikki. Um, she's she's fantastic. Um, and she she started like she did this whole thing, and she said she was like uh, I was like I was a drug addict this, and and I walked in, she started crying, and then we did this this whole scene where um, I have these double doors at my gym where I'm standing here in this suit, and the double doors open, everyone's just staring at the camera wearing my shirt, and everyone's like, yo, this is money, this is it, I don't care what, this is your new That's thing, great. and it was awesome, it was so refreshing, and it was just this impulse, it was an impulsive idea that I let marinate, and I really thought about like. Like, how could I take what is truly relatable to me and how can I put this out there that is an over-the-top, larger-than-life presentation of who I am that I could relate to? And I laid it out and that was it. Um, so most of the places I work for, I am the bad guy, but it, it's it's almost like you can kind of see it both ways sure, sometimes. Sure. And uh, Warriors is, is the one place I am still full-fledged a good guy, but you can also take this character or me and you can just you know i just do it the real way so like just you know the the, the real life when i'm when i'm a good guy it's just it's perspective hey you know i i use my real life story i was this that and now i go out of my way to help other people and now all those people that i've helped want to see me get my success yeah and i feed off of your energy and thank you for believing in me i'm going to do it for you that's a good guy yeah bad guy's just the opposite yeah. same same presentation in a lot of ways still the life-changing joe Cassio. it's just perspective how you look yeah, at it yeah, and how yeah, we go yeah, with for it. sure right right i love that um and, and and by the way guys i want to share uh uh that that joe has really hit his stride uh big time i'm gonna i'm gonna talk to you about current and past uh accolades in wrestling so currently as i said before ffw heavyweight championship and the ffw tag team championship in the past former nywc tag champion two-time former wow tag champion former WOW heavyweight champion, former FTW Gen X champion and heavyweight champion, former MVW heavyweight champion. That does not happen by accident. Um, I, 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 oh man, I, I could do a whole other episode on, on all this stuff. A uh, couple more questions, then we're going to get into the big three. The big sure. three, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, talking in wrestling. I know I know the work that has to go into the physicality right. of it and learn how important is it to you in your opinion uh, to be a talker in wrestling? Hugely. It's one, it, you talk about big three. I think there's maybe big three or big four in wrestling that you should have. Talking is extremely important. When it comes to being a pro wrestler, um, if you're trying to make it to WWE, AEW, if you're trying to make it on television, you have to remember that you, you firstly, you are a television star. Yep. And if you can't talk and you're a TV star, it's not so great. Um, the, the the talking, the the promos or the vignettes, whatever you want to say, the speaking part of wrestling is yep. a lot of times where you're drawing people into why I should care about you. It's something that the UFC has borrowed a lot from. Conor McGregor's of the world. You want to hear him run his mouth to get it shut. Muhammad Ali was in boxing, the guy who said he learned this from Gorgeous George, a yep. founding pro wrestler. Yep. People will pay to see me get my mouth shut. Yep. So the talk talking is is essential. And if you see there's a lot of guys in the industry too that you'll watch, and, and this is really kind of inside baseball, but there's wrestlers that performers that are so incredibly talented in the ring that if you just watch their in-ring work and that's all that matters, these guys should be multi-time heavyweight champions. But because they lack in the speaking department, they never hit the top. They never become the heavyweight champion. They might be the king of the middle, but they'll never get to that next step. So it is, you know, it doesn't happen for everyone because there are, you know, there's guys like Paul Heyman who can speak for you. Well, that's that's Managers, what I was going to say. You right. have to be, when, when you, if you want to take this chance, especially in this business, and you don't have all of those things you need, like being a talker, it is literally one in a million you have to be right. the most gifted athlete in the world to be sort of gifted the opportunity to get there and then they give you a mouthpiece. Right. You know, like you didn't hear Brock Lesnar speak for the first 10 years of his yeah, career. Yeah. It was always Paul Heyman. Right. And he, he wasn't a unique, but here's the thing, right? Lesnar wasn't the greatest talker. He was okay. But look at Brock yeah. freaking Lesnar. He's a freak of nature. He is uh, he, uh, in a class of his own NCAA yeah. champion, UFC heavyweight champion, WWE. Ch I mean, he everything he does, and he looks like a freaking Viking warrior. Yeah. yeah. And at 45, he's still massively jacked. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. Even the, you look he's at a freak. guy like Roman Reigns. Honestly, like, he didn't need as much help as, as 
Brock Lesnar did in terms of, of speaking. And look, now Brock is out there in this different and character. And he can talk. And he can talk. Look at now. that, After right? After years of working with the best manager in history. Yeah. Right? Now you have uh, Roman Reigns, who's been working with... You know, I greatest. always said with Roman Reigns, I'm like, there's a disconnect because the guy's got the body, the physicality, the, the wrestling prowess. You know, and he's a legacy, right? And he's a, a, a child of the, white, the, of the wild Samoans. Yeah. Like, come on. Um, he actually was on last night's episode of Young Yeah, they, they're alluding. They're alluding to WrestleMania that, let me tell you happening. Something. That was and huge. You know the reason that show happens, right? Let me tell you everyone a little secret. Yeah. We're going to have a president of the United States at some point that's going to be named Dwayne The Rock Johnson. <laughs> and the reason I believe in my heart that he is doing this show, the whole show, is he is running for president in pitch. 2032 <laughs> and telling you his life story. Just like Roman Reigns and The Rock pre, uh, giving a little foreshadowing for WrestleMania, we're going to have a president named That Rock was Roman. huge. But I saw that. I was like, my, like and my wife doesn't give a shit. But she was like, I was like, did you see that? She's like, I don't know. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like... They're foreshadowing. They're yes. going to fight at WrestleMania yeah. next year. Yeah. Yeah. That'll yeah. be a big match. Money. Oh, money. Money, money. money. Um, yeah, man. I, I totally see what you're talking about because you have the wrestlers out there who are just technically so good. But who do you remember? The Stone Cold, The Rocks, the Dusty Rhodes, Hulk right. Hogan, CM Punk, the Pipe Bomb. I mean, yep. you know, the, the talkers out there are what make this industry right. what it is. And, there, and listen, there's exceptions to the rule for sure. But if you look at, you're going to, right, if you really want to make it, if you want to do this, you want to give yourself, and this is what I used to tell my students, you want to give yourself every single reason to make it. Don't leave holes. If you're not in shape, and you don't have to be jacked to the point of a bodybuilder, but you should look like an athlete, unless you're the novelty and your character is somebody who's right. that sumo, then, then be the biggest sumo guy, you know what I mean? Like, yep. if you, if you, you, even if you're decent at, like for example, I was only always known as a pretty damn good talker, yep. but even so, I'm like, when I realized I wanted to get back into this and try to get on TV, quickly i'm like you know i'm gonna go to an acting coach and even though i'm already good at this i'm like i could get better and if i could perfect it yeah. if i could be a movie or tv star level quality actor then i'm definitely gonna get you know it, it'll happen for me. I'm, I'm a lot i'm a lot closer to that goal than just about any of my peers right so it's it's those little things that it's 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 knowing that if i invest that much further what other people aren't doing it's going to increase my chances at my goal absolutely right why 100%. why why leave why leave there why leave any room to not hit that goal why yeah. there's no reason absolutely um a couple of questions sure. random questions Please, about ahead. the go, character go. and then and then we'll wrap up uh Finishers. What are your finishers? Okay, so I have a running knee uh -huh. from the knee, kind of like the knee trembler that Regal does. Uh -huh. Called the need for change. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, one of my signatures I do is a gut check. It's you. It, I, it'll get the three sometimes, but not all the time. That's when I pick him up in a in a fireman's carry, uh -huh. which is like over the shoulder. Think of a fireman carrying somebody. Yeah. And then you throw them up and you jump under them, bring your knees up, and they crash down gut first into your knees called the gut check yeah. double knee gut buster that's another one of my signatures uh and then i also have the suplex into the cutter so i do a suplex i float them over to my shoulder and i do the cutter yeah yeah yeah. and i have a new move coming out soon but i can't let you know what that is because ah. my opponents can't know but i have something that's in the works all right so all speak. right <laughs> baby face or heel what do you prefer uh and by the way for, for those out there that are not uh in the know baby face, baby face is a good guy heels a bad guy you know that is such I would, know, oh, man. Being a heel is really fun. Being a bad guy is really fun because you have so much creative freedom to do whatever the hell you want. Yeah. Because your goal is for people to boo you, to not like you. Um, but I will say, I've, I've been um, so I've been good guy and bad guy. I've done both. I've had probably generally more success as a bad guy, and I've enjoyed it more for the most part. But I will say this: I've been doing a babyface run in uh, Warriors. And it has, I've, this is the first time I'm, I'm really, really enjoying the run as a Bayface. The guy that I've been working primarily with, counterparts, guy named Darius Carter. He is excellent. He's another guy who's been doing this for like 10 years or more. Um, he's starting to really get his accolades out there now. He's starting to become respected more, which he should be. Um, and he's such a good, bad yeah. guy that it's easy. And we work together really well. Our styles mesh. Uh, really well, so uh, I would I would say generally heal, but I will say, and I guess it's the same thing I've heard when you have a really really good baby face run, if it's really effing good, a yeah. lot of times like it, it's 
I, I'm feeling that right now. Yeah, that's yeah. good, man. It's cool. It's good. It's cool. I, I'll tell you. So, so going back to to moves and stuff and 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 monikers. So I know we we joked about muscles marinara and <laughs> yeah. all that stuff and launch it. So I, I'll tell people where that came from. So um, that was never a real wrestling name or character that I ever was going to do. When I did train for for a few months uh, uh, with NYWC years ago, a lifetime ago, 15, 16 years ago, um, I. I, I thought about it for a minute, you know, and I came up with this character called Trinity, and uh, you know, he was a he was a rock style character because that was just what was hidden back then, what yep, was popping yep, out yep, there. Yep. Um, Muscles Marinara, <laughs> Muscles Marinara was the joke that at work everybody always knew I was a huge wrestling fan, so I just came up with that name one day, uh, and we would joke about it forever. And I would, uh, my thing was I was. Muscles Marinara is like that 80s style with the wet long hair, right? With the neon bicep tassels, right? And the and the and the wife beater, white, white uh, tank top on, right? And I used to in the store, right, when I was in the pharmacy industry still and I was in independent pharmacy, we would lock up at night, right? And I would play separate ways by journey. That was that was Muscles Marinara theme song. And the the lights were off and I would take my shirt off and I'd have my white tank top on. And I would grab two bottles of Aquanet hairspray, and I would run down the aisles just pumping hairspray. <laughs> <laughs> that was Muscles Marinara. That was the beginning and end of Muscles Marinara. Oh man, Muscles I Marinara actually, and I'm gonna I'm gonna find this video and send you a picture of it, a screenshot of it. Muscles Marinara made a comeback two years ago during the pandemic. Um, I was. Uh, doing this coaching class, this public speaking coaching class online during the pandemic. Um, and we did a special class, my, the guy that I was partnering with at the time, um, we did a special class on voice. And both of us being huge wrestling fans, we used wrestling as uh, uh, the impetus for, for the class. And we came dressed as he oh had a character God. and I had I had this pink tank top on I put a uh, a blonde wig on with the headband oh, and the that's whole thing. great it's like Randy the Ram Robinson oh uh, yeah, uh, yeah 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 that's yeah. what I'm seeing right now <laughs> that's amazing I love all right it. guys time for the big three the big three from the launch cast the big three, Joe, and I probably should have warned you about this this is easy though the big three hey. is we're gonna list a, uh, just a, a a few random things you're gonna give me your top Three quick, concise answers for these three. Sure. All right? So these are going to be hard, by the way. Uh, three best overall wrestlers of all time. Oh, you bastard. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, God, because wrestling is a hard spectrum because it, it depends on what the criteria judges. Is is I'm it, saying overall. We're going to get into criteria in a minute, though. Okay, overall. Oh, Undertaker. Yep. <sighs> Stone Cold. And The Rock. Yeah. Oh, those uh, are good, man. I mean, and there's a lot that I can. You could have given me three other ones, and I still would have agreed. Yeah. But I agree with those three. I, I, they're, sure. they're, yeah. That's that's just, just longevity, marketability, uh, draw, money made. Those are just like three that come to my head. And it's a tough, it's a tough question because you have guys years ago that came 40 years before these right. guys that – Never. Bruno San Martino could right. be in there. Hulk Hogan could be in there. Bruno San Martino is the guy, like, when you ask a true basketball fan their top five basketball players and they put, like, an Oscar Robertson in there, right. that's, like, the Bruno San Martino right. of wrestling. So let, let me, like, just to give you a quick reason why I use those people, too, there are so many people who you could use in that criteria. That's just my, that's my generation. So yeah. they're the first people that came to my head. I'm like, all right, Always. how do I Same. answer this? Best people came to my head, quickest, Undertaker, Austin, Rock. And if you look at their impact on the world... Um, even outside of wrestling, they're 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 and that's huge, right? And that's the thing; it can't be. If I want to just judge in ring work, it would be like Bret Hart. All right, so, so okay. let's get to that. Sure. So next one in the big three best technical wrestlers of all time: Kurt Angle, Bret Hart. I would. Oh, I can't. There's another person that I will not speak of that I would put would have put it in that category had certain things not happened. Um, other than that, I. I would say like well, you got to talk that one afterwards. Well, yeah, we'll talk <laughs> afterward. Um, you could, uh, but Brian Danielson, I would yeah. say too. He's unbelievable, and I could put Regal as a fourth, just on the you know. Yeah, but those guys are all just yeah, 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 yeah. Bret Hart and Owen Hart. Oh, geez, I know I'm going off, but Owen was great. The whole Hart family. Kurt Angle is just un freaking believable. He is so yeah. good. Yeah, so we'll call this the Big Seven. Yeah, Maybe. right. Sorry, I'm just going <laughs> off now. Three best talkers of all time. Oh, yeah. 
The Rock, Cena. Cena's good. I don't good. care what anyone says. Cena yeah. is unbelievable. Oh. He embraced being. He was. He was. You gotta. You gotta give it up for the guy because it was rumored or wanted for years that he would have a heel turn, and it never happened. And he he would have had probably the greatest heel turn since Hogan went to the NWO. Mm-hmm. And he didn't do it. Nope. And he probably would have sustained that. It was his choice to not yeah. be wrestling every day anymore. But he, he would have sustained that career even longer. Had yeah. He, done that. he could have done that. He could have done it. But I actually respect that he didn't. I, yeah. I, I like that he stayed true to who he yeah. was. Well, it was he, a mission, too. If you it was think like about the, it, the message he was putting out there. Right. If you think about it, he, he, and he said this in an interview, and it was so genius. He goes, I am a heel for the people who don't want. Like the, He's like, the adults that I would be turning heel for, the 18 to 24 demographic or 18 to 32, he's like, they already boo me. So I'm already a bad guy for them. Yeah. He's like, the kids that want to like me, they like me. He's like, if I if I flip it, he's like, he's like, there's no reason. Yeah. I'm already a heel for the people who don't like me, and I'm a baby face for the ones yep. that do. Yep. And the ones that do like me, I'm, I'm way better off for them to believe in the hustle, loyalty, yep. respect. Yep. So that's why I, I, res- I respect him a lot. So um, you got The Rock, Cena. Uh, oh, shit. <sighs> you got to put me in such a bad place. <laughs> I mean, uh, I would... Piper. Piper. It was close, man. I would have put Punk in there. Miz would have been an, an alternative because Miz is very talented. Is very so a lot of guys just want to give the credit to, but yeah. Piper, I mean, he was just on. I mean, top 10 is much easier for Top 10 is yeah. easier, but I would yeah. say that's probably a healthy, I think that's a healthy yeah. top three. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So let's move on from, from the wrestlers. Three biggest failures for you ever. Oh, geez. Biggest failures. Um, the night that I had that opportunity in 2018 with WWN and I just crapped the bed because I let myself get to my head. Um, another big failure for me, man. I'm sorry. This just, I'm just letting oh, you good. marinate a little bit. Uh, that one hurt me. Um, I'd say, I want to say that time frame in 2015, you want to know what I did? You know, even though things I said told you was upward trajectory until 2016, I think I let myself down. There are more, what I look back at now is there's more things I could have been doing. There were more shows I could have been attending just to show up and show my face and get out there. There are some, there were some uh, clinics and seminars that were free that I could have went to. There's one in Jersey with Fit Finley Mm. and I chose at the time because I wasn't booked on these shows and booked and like, you know, even though it was free and I could have just drove to Jersey, I had plans to go out and have a good time. Yeah. And I consider that a failure because in my head, if I go back now, I mean, I was in my early twenties. So of course, you know, sure. If I had went and done those things, that momentum that I spoke of that I lost after I got hurt might've came a lot quicker and I would have had the right people um, that would have had my back. That yeah. would have made sure that I came back. So that I consider uh, a, a huge failure. Um, and um, I, my, my last biggest failure um, for me is letting, I'd say letting the injuries overtake my mind. I, I, if there's any young athletes that are listening to this, injuries happen. They suck. A lot of times it happens at bad, you know, inopportune moments, but yep. that's part of life. A lot of things are going to happen at inopportune moments that you got to step over. And I feel like, although I built myself in the, in the fitness industry and everything happened for a reason, the mental state that I let myself stay in because I got hurt and the way that I let my confidence shut down and not reaching out to the right people for help, maybe to get over that, um, I feel like I wasted valuable time. And yep. that I feel like was a failure. Yeah. 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 It's huge, man. Uh, all right. Last one. Three biggest successes. Oh, three basic biggest successes. Overcoming obesity because that could have easily went the other way. Um, it's just unhealthy. I could have, you know, God knows what happened. Yep. Uh, I'd say. Wrestling at Barclay, I wrestled at Barclay Center in 2019, which was awesome. Oh, get out. Yeah, um, it was like 10,000 people. Wow. That was cool. That was um, one of the moments of, again, 
that that show was one, another. Remember, I told you there were some shows people were telling me like, so a lot of my students, old students, were on this one, and uh, it was actually it was a Yams Day. It was it was a rap event, and um, they what they they incorporated wrestling in the event. Which oh cool. wow, yeah, that's so cool. I was, I was backstage. I saw like Drake walk past me. It was weird. Like, that's I'm like, great. Like, back, <laughs> like one of my backstage. <laughs> but uh, that was the, the the respect I got from the people who were there with me because I had I I was kind of like just kind of getting back in, and that that was a really big moment for me. Um, but I, I think, uh, the, the biggest thing I, you know, I have success for, and I would say the biggest successful moment for me, I, 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 I guess it's just like the year of 2021. Yeah. That's the best way to put it. Cause I, 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 I got engaged to my fiance, which was scary, but amazing. Cause she's younger than me. And I'm like, oh, she might not want to do this yet, but I loved her and I knew that it was the right move. And I started my business and I took that chance on myself again. Um, and you know, I, in 2021 too is when things started steamrolling again for wrestling I, I i completely invested in myself i did the new character and that that chance that i took in myself really started to pay off and um i, I would say just getting out of bad situations because the, the place that i worked for in the fitness industry before was not going to get me to my lifelong goal even yep. though it was comfortable yep i got out of my comfort zone and i and i took a real stand and i feel like i finally became my true self uh, as an adult this 2021 so those are my my biggest successes I would love say. that love yeah. that yeah. guys we did it again here this was oh man this, this was, was awesome this was one of my favorites in a while man I, it's been uh i gotta tell you it's uh we're trying to evolve a, as a show but season one for me was like just week after week it was this kind of like deep dive interview right you know? right right uh, and then the pandemic happened and things change and now it's like you know, people's first inclination is always if on an interview, it's going to be Zoom and whatever. And OK, you know, we'll make it happen. And, and it's different style interviews, short form interviews. We do our soapbox shows, but nothing gets me as pumped for this show as as these kind of interviews. And to have somebody in the studio and somebody who's got the same interest, man, it's 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 great, man. So this was this was a blast. A lot. I want you to know a lot of people are going to get a lot uh out of this wrestling fans or not um we speak to leadership doesn't matter what the thing is right, right it's just about we speak to leadership and that's that's kind of all that matters here and and what people take away from this so um guys follow joe ocasio uh life changer joe ocasio look at those muscles man i i am very upset because i i wore i wanted to wear my my launch pad 516 shirt which is like a weird <laughs> like gilded shitty like t-shirt <laughs> that's not like a, so i'm feeling a little uh, emasculated right now i was gonna wear my my team launch pad uh uh tank top here but i don't want to show you up yeah, Joe yeah, i can't do that i want to show you up <laughs> i was gonna shoot on you one more time before we go but i think i'm gonna let it be like that because we we did it right here uh joe thank you for joining us today it appreciate it brother absolute honor thank All you right. so much let me uh take over the screen here guys another one another one another one we did it episode 321 in the books check out all of joe's links that i'm going to put in the show notes check out joe's results zone contact joe if you want to get in shape and change your life for real not the fake uh not the fake one he's doing on the wrestling shows um 6 a.m. every single Monday morning, Apple Podcast, Spotify, iHeartRadio. I feel a little empty inside right now because I didn't get to do my full introduction that I normally do, but I'm going to let this one go today uh, because we enjoyed ourselves. I, you probably will have seen some cool promo videos that we're going to put out um, uh, leading up to this show, like the one that Joe had sent me uh, the other day and one that I'm going to record tomorrow on him and and he doesn't even know what's coming um but yeah follow joe keep following the show uh brought to you by launchpad 516 studios check out the other shows on our platforms guys we'll see you next time launch sequence terminated into the black hole You're listening to The LaunchCast, produced by Launchpad 516 Studios with me, your host, the launch dad himself, George Andriopoulos. Into the black the LaunchCast is brought to you by Launchpad 516 Studios, produced by Fabrizio Fugazi and executive produced by George Andriopoulos. Marketing and PR by Media Convergence. Theme song by Tommy Lungberg. Music and sound effects are licensed through Epidemic Sound. The LaunchCast is hosted with Podbean. 
Make sure to subscribe to this feed wherever podcasts are available and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts while you're at it, guys. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Pandora, TuneIn, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Podbean, and everywhere else that podcasts are available. Follow me, George Andriopoulos, the host at Launchpad CEO on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or follow the show at The Launchcast Show on Facebook and Instagram, or at Launchcast Show on Twitter. Visit our website, thelaunchcast.com, and make sure to follow all the great podcasts produced by Launchpad 516 Studios. We'll see you next time, guys. Can you